a few to say a few things about uh, our chief guest, introduce her, and then uh, uh, we move on the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yates Singh. I would request that please uh, uh, remove the presentation at this point because I have to read my write up. Can you down? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. A.K. Singh, Honorable President Nas, Dr. Trilochan Mahapatra, who is going to join us soon, Dr. R.B. Singh, past president Nas, esteemed speaker, Dr. Shkuntala Harak Singh Thrustad, members of Nas Executive Council, valued fellowship Nas, ladies and gentlemen. I am greatly honored to introduce Nas from, from Nas Foundation Day speaker, I begin by uh, giving a brief introduction to the subject of today's lecture. In 2021, the World Food Prize Foundation underlined that not only crops, but fish are also key for reducing hunger and malnutrition. The Foundation Day amplifies this observation by highlighting that fish are integral to the diets of more than 1 billion people worldwide, or every sixth person in the world depends on fish for food and nutrition, such an important subject. In recognition of that fact, World Food Prize Foundation announced that this 21, that is 2021 laureate is Dr. Shakuntala Harak Singh Thilastad, who is the illustrious speaker for today's NAS Foundation Day Lecture. Dr. Thilastad, I would prefer to refer her as Dr. Shakuntala, with which I am more familiar to address. Dr. Shakuntala is a nutrition scientist who has done more work than anyone else to draw attention to the essential but often overlook, overlooked rule of aquatic foods, who has done more work than anyone else to draw attention to the essential but often overlooked rule of aquatic fish foods in sustainable healthy diets. She was named for the World Food Prize for her grand, gro groundbreaking research, critical insights and landmark innovations in developing nutrition-sensitive approaches to aquatic food systems, including fisheries and aquaculture, and integrated food production <laughs> from land and water. Remarkably, <clears throat> she is the first woman of Asian heritage, more correctly, of Indian descent, to be awarded the World Food Prize. My congratulations. Announcing the world, uh, announcing the award during the webcast event by the World Food Prize Foundation, U.S. Secretary of State. Anthony Blinken said, Dr. Slister figured out how the nutrient-rich small fish can be raised locally and inexpensively. Now millions of low-income families across many countries, including Bangladesh, Cambodia, India, Nepal, Burma, Zambia, Malawi, are eating small fish regularly, dried and fresh, in everything from chutneys to porridge, giving kids and breastfeeding mothers by nutrients that will protect children for a lifetime. That is all thanks to her, I unquote. Fish and other aquatic foods, as I stated earlier, are integral to diet of more than 1 billion people worldwide. More importantly, I wish to underline that most of these people are poor, live in low and middle income countries in Africa, Asia and Pacific, close to rivers, lakes or the sea. In these regions, foods like fresh and dried fish are central to local cuisines and are often cheaper or more available than alternative nutritious foods like eggs, dairy products, and fruit. These aquatic superfoods, as they are called, pack, uh, pack, an, pack an outside punch as rich sources of micronutrients that are essential to human health and cognitive development. Cognitive development is a problem of present day situation. Now a brief peep into speaker's personal and professional profile. Shkuntala was born in 1949 in the Caribbean island of Trinidad in the small village of Reform, where the main industry was sugar production. Most of the inhabitants, including Shkuntala's family, were dependents, descendants of Indian Hindu migrants brought to Trinidad to engage in agricultural labor. Shkuntala attended Naparima Girls High School from an age of 10. Her teachers helped her you cultivate interest in many different subjects from math and science to language, geography, and history, developing a passion for interdisciplinary scholarship right from early age and learning skills, principles, and values she has drawn on throughout her life. 
she completed her she completed her undergraduate education at the trinidad campus of the university of the west indies where she earned a bsc in tropical agriculture in 1971 while working as an agriculture officer in tobago she met her husband kin thlister after marrying they moved to finn's home country of denmark where shakuntala took up post graduate studies under the mentorship of dr paul martin rees in 1980 she was awarded a phd in physiology of nutrition from the royal veterinary and agriculture institute commencing her career as the first and only woman in the ministry of agriculture that was situation in india also agriculture lands and fisheries on the island of tobacco dr shakuntala now serves as the global lead for nutrition and public health at world fish a global cgi research center uh, headquartered in malaysia her work guides world fish other research institutions major funders government agencies and public and private organizations to work together to reshape food systems to deliver on un sustainable development goal a need of the hour shuntala moved to bangladesh in the late 1980s to work at the international center for diarrheal disease research which treated more than 6000 malnourished children annually as a young mother of two children she is mother of two children she was in- instinctively concerned about child health and nutrition and began investigating measures to prevent malnutrition using lo- using locally available and culturally acceptable foods nothing new from outside moved to bangladesh as i have glanced through her biography proved to be a mild turning point of her career from that assignment onwards dr shakuntala has worked tirelessly to translate key insights from her research into public policy this has included partnership closely with governments in india even such as the state government of odisha in our country which recently began including dried fish in food rations that it provides to vulnerable groups a very important move i would say because odisha is a state where poverty is very deep and uh, uh, vulnerability to in malnutrition is very high she has also advised an array of high professional in international organizations including the food and agriculture organization of the united nations the us agency for international development <coughs> the international fund for agriculture development and unicef her efforts have raised awareness on the value of aquatic foods in healthy food systems and fostered broader commitments to supporting this transformative goal i on my behalf and behalf of entire nas fellowship extend our greetings and congratulate and commend her for winning 2021 world food prize we are deeply honored on accepting our invitation dr shuntala to deliver the nas foundation day lecture entitled the role of aquatic foods in nourishing nations i am immensely privi- privileged to invite you dr shukuntala to deliver your speech thank you very much dr shukuntala please thank you so much for that kind introduction good evening from penang malaysia and i wish to thank the fellows of the national academy of agricultural sciences india for inviting me to deliver the foundation day lecture and for being so kind as to move the date from the 5th to the 4th because we are in lockdown in Malaysia and tomorrow morning i will be flying back to i will be flying back to denmark so thank you so much for for accommodating me can we have the slide please Thank you so much. So my talk today is going to be on the role of aquatic foods in nourishing nations. And I one of the changes that that I've made in all the years I've worked is instead of using the word feeding in I use the word nourishing. And as I go through this lecture and presentation, I hope you will understand why it is important for me that to make this change in the narrative from feeding to nourishing. Next slide, please. So I will talk about what are aquatic foods 
define it and give the diversity, which is extremely important, and talk about aquatic foods for sustainable development. Thereafter, I will talk about the benefits of aquatic foods in terms of micronutrients and bioavailability. And thereafter, give an introduction to the global perspective on food and nutrition security and give some uh, evidence on aquatic foods for nourishing nations. And lastly, I want to leave five key messages with you. In presenting, in giving this presentation, I will draw on examples from, from, from different countries, but also draw on examples from the work that I and my colleagues are doing together with the state government of Odisha and the SAM. Next slide, please. So there has been a change in just not looking at fish of the Sentai work is called World Fish, but the change is that we know that foods from water are diverse and they are made up of many different foods, animals, plants, and microorganisms. And now we know that there is an interest in going, having cell and plant-based foods from new technologies. In the past, some of the technologies that were used, for example, from FAO is fin, is fish, which gives a very smaller diversity of the total aquatic foods. And for example, many talk about seafood, which talk, which refers to edible marine fish and shellfish. And we do know that when we work with aquatic foods, that aquatic foods come from marine waters, but much, much aquatic foods also stem from inland waters. For example, the Great Lakes of Africa, rivers, and a lot of aquatic food stem from seasonal wetlands and inland water bodies. Next slide, please. So when we talk about aquatic foods, another shift is that we do not only now look at the production of aquatic foods and very small range of aquatic foods, but we talk about the whole aquatic food system, which is made up of elements, activities, and outcomes. And many who work with agriculture, they work at the one end of agriculture with production systems and the inputs to production. But when you talk about the food system, it goes all the way from inputs to production and all the way to consumption and even beyond consumption, the waste that is left on the plate after consumption. So there are different parts of the food systems that we must take into consideration. We must take into consideration the people who are engaged in the food systems, the environment, the processes, the infrastructures, the institutions, and then the activities as we talk about the production systems, but beyond production, processing, distribution, preparation of foods, consumption, and as I mentioned, also disposal of, of waste and loss. And when we talk about incomes, we talk about many different outcomes in terms of nutrition and health and food security, but also in terms of the socioeconomic and environmental incomes. Next slide, please. So these three elements, the social, the economic, and the environmental make up the different parts of the aquatic food systems as they pertain to sustainable development. And as I mentioned before, when we talk about the social part, a lot of that has to do with livelihoods of the many small scale actors that depend on fisheries and aquaculture. It is estimated that over 800,000 800, uh, are engaged in the primary sectors of fisheries and aquaculture, and that more than half of these are women. When we talk about the economic elements, we talk about the, about the aquatic foods being affordable, and they are in many instances preferred and culturally accepted aquatic foods. Environmental, we talk about 
the, that these foods can be produced sustainably and we sustainably and we know that many aquatic foods are produced more sustainably than terrestrial animal source foods and that they have and that the lower trophic aquatic foods are produced more sustainable than those from the higher trophic areas. Next slide, please. So if I would just give one example of the different elements and talk about the environmental footprint of aquatic foods. And this is extremely important, as you all know, because there is many now considerations of climate, climate change, climate resilience, and there are many um, many elements of climate that are affecting the food systems. If you look at the slide to the left, that shows you conversion efficiency, how much of feed goes into the animals and how much and, and how much of, the, of, of that's produced. So as you can see here, the beef, pork and fish, that it's fish less than for pork and beef, the amount of fish the amount of feed, sorry, that is necessary to produce the equivalent amount of beef, pork, or fish, and it's much lower. So the conversion efficiency for fish, and this is in general, because as I mentioned, you have many different fish species, so that if you would look at the different fish species, it would be different, but this is a general picture you see for here in, com in, com in, in comparing three animal source foods. If you look to the right, the emissions in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus, you would also see that fish and other aquatic animals, they have much lower emissions than beef, pork, or chicken. And if within aquatic foods, if you look at fish and you look at the bivalves, you would see that the bivalves have much less, um, much less emissions than the fish have. Next slide, please. So this is again another change that we talk about when we talk about aquatic foods. If you will look at many um, articles that have been written about fish and other aquatic foods, in the first three lines, there would be talk about fish and aquatic foods as being a rich source of protein. That's true, but there are many other foods that are rich sources of protein. If you just take the dals in, uh, and pulses in India, they're extremely rich sources of protein. And I just want to make the point that protein is an essential macronutrient, but animal protein is not an essential part of the protein. You can easily get your, the proteins you need from combinations of plant source proteins. However, what is new and um, what I have worked with is the role that aquatic foods play in contributing to multiple micronutrients and essential fatty acids. So this is the focus of my work. And when we talk about the vitamins and minerals, it's a multitude, multiple vitamins. For example, vitamin A, vitamin B12, which is crucial for cognition in children, vitamin D and minerals, calcium, iron, iodine, zinc, and many fish species are also rich in essential fatty acids. Now in India, there, there is a lot of work that's being done on different fish species. But if you go to other, other countries, for example, Japan, Korea, China, Thailand, um, a large part of the aquatic foods is made up of microorganisms, of seaweeds, of algae, and they are also rich in multiple micronutrients and also essential fatty acids. Next slide, please. 
So one of the points that I would like to drive home is that aquatic foods are a major source of essential micronutrients. And this is important because in the diets of many poor and vulnerable people, even though they may meet the needs for energy, they may meet the needs for, for protein, they do not need meet the needs of essential micronutrients. And you would hear many talk about hidden hunger, micronutrient deficiencies being a major problem worldwide. So I've talked about the multiple vitamins and and uh, vitamins and minerals that are found in aquatic foods. But one thing that you must also note is that in some of, um, uh, that the components of some of these vitamins and minerals are quite different from other sources of food. If you would take, for example, vitamin A in, uh, in many animals, in many in animal source foods, the preformed source is retinol A1. But in fish, a major part of the vitamin A is found as dehydroretinol, vitamin A2. And this form of of, of, of vitamin A is extremely bioavailable. Not many people know about that because the methods for measuring dehydroretinol um, is quite difficult and quite, uh, quite complex. And there are not many labs in the world that measure dehydroretinol. I've mentioned before about B12 being so essential for brain development and cognition, and it's an essential micronutrient found in aquatic foods. Riboflavin, vitamin D12, which is important, for example, in temperate zones, vitamin E, and then the minerals, iron, zinc, calcium, phosphorus, selenium, iodine. And one of the things that's extremely important is that if you take iron and zinc found in animal source foods, including uh, and also aquatic foods, they are highly bioavailable compared to iron and zinc components found in plant source foods. Next slide, please. So aquatic foods bring with them many essential micronutrients and essential fatty acids. However, there are much more benefits of aquatic foods when they are on the plate with other foods. I've already mentioned the high bioavailability of the nutrients found in aquatic foods. But one of the great advantage is that aquatic foods found on the plate with other plant source foods, they enhance the micronutrient bioavailability when they are consumed together. And also aquatic foods, because of the way it's prepared, many times with vegetables and with spices, they bring with it greater dietary diversity through the meal preparation and through the consumption patterns. So one thing is what they bring with them intrinsically in terms of nutrient contribution, but even more importantly, when they are combined with on, in a meal and on the plate, of food with the other foods, the rice, the chapati, with the dal, with the with, 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 with vegetables, and with the spices, you know, green chili, they bring with them much more than just the value they come with. Next slide, please. One of the things that I want to also drive home is that within the group of aquatic foods, there's a large diversity. And of course, in this diverse aquatic foods, there are different ranges of micronutrients and essential fatty acids. But it's well worth noting that small pelagic fish, they are by far much higher in micronutrients and in essential fatty acids than many of the larger fish and other aquatic foods. As you can see here, these uh, graphs and the darker figures, the darker 
sorry, colors show the percentage of the different nutrients to the recommended nutrient intake. And the darker shades, uh, a few reaching up to 100% on the lighter shades, uh, if you have um, if, if you are not reaching to high, to high nutrient contributions with the intake. Next slide, please. One of the points that I would like to raise here is about when we know that aquatic foods are so important for nourishing people, then we should be doing all we can to ensure that this that these foods reach to people and especially the poor and the vulnerable. But we do know that there is an issue because very much of aquatic foods, especially, I just talked about the small, about the pelagic small fish, which are so rich in micronutrients. We know that many of this fish is used for making fish meal and fish oil, which is used extensively in aquaculture and also for poultry feeds, also for feeding pets, dogs and cats. And the nutrients that are found in these pelagic small fish, they are therefore lost to nourishing people when they are used for fish meal and fish oil. This picture that I show you here is from a plant, a fish meal plant in Udipi in Karnataka. And there are tons and tons of small fish, sardines, which are used for producing fish meal and fish oil for feeding sh the shrimp industry. And we do know if we do the calculations that one kilo of dried fish, which approximately is equivalent to four kgs of fresh fish, they can provide sufficient essential nutrients for a child for more than two months. And here I've used um, a small portion of intake, 15 grams of dried fish per child per day. So that's about that is about a teaspoon of fish that will that can nourish children. But yet this is lost when this fish is used for fish meal and fish oil. So I would like to to think. I would like us to talk about when we have the discussion. How can we use this missed opportunity? Yeah. And what, 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 what um, alternatives do we have to replace fish meal and fish oil? For example, with seaweed, with crop waste. And also I would like us to think about, is there a way when, when companies are making very high profits on selling shrimp, on selling fish meal and fish oil, can some of this fish, they, these small fish, can they be used as in terms of social corporate responsibility and some of this return as fish-based products to the communities, the poor and vulnerable communities from which these fish have been derived. Next slide, please. So I've talked about one of the ways in which we are losing fish for nourishing people. The next one I want to, the next area I want to, to, to bring is that at a global level, it is estimated that one third of all food that is produced is lost. And that's the same, that is the same for fish and other aquatic foods. And I haven't done the calculation here for, for India or for any states in India, I, I should do that. But if I work a lot in Zambia, Zambia um, has lots of lakes. Um, and if you would look at a reduction in the fish loss and waste by just 1%, that would amount to 10 kgs of more fish per person per year for 250 people, 1,000 people. And if I would do the same calculation for India, of course, you have much higher production and you have much higher waste and loss. So we will be able to nourish much more people by reducing waste and loss in India. 
We should also look at, therefore, at improving the methods for processing and storage, and also how we can use different parts of fish and other aquatic animals which are removed in processing. How can we use them? Can we use them to make fish products for, um, for humans, or can we use them in, in the circular economy? Um, this picture, as you see here, these are sad, the, the harvesting of sardines from UDP in Connecticut, and nearly all what you see here on these boats are designed for the shrimp, for, for the plants that make fish meal and fish oil for the shrimp industry. Next slide, please. Now, let me go back to the global perspective. And let us think about how it is that aquatic foods can help to nourish people and nourish nations. And if you look at the global perspective, we know that about 9% of the global population, 690 million people are undernourished and 2 billion people do not have access to nutritious and sufficient food. 3 billion people are unable to afford a healthy diet. And many of these live in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. At the same time where we have malnourishment and undernourished people, we are having a large increase in the number of adults and also children who are overweight and obese. So we, we have this and on the one hand, for example, you may have a person who is consuming too much energy, leading to overweight and obesity. And at the same time, that person is consuming very little nutritious, diverse foods and suffering at the same time from micronutrient deficiencies. And if we look also, those were for adults, those figures I have at the top. If we look also from children under the age of five years, we know about a fifth of the global population of children are stunted. They, they are too short for their age. And we know that even among children, we are having an increase in overweight children. And this increase of uh, overweight children is, in, is, 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 is increasing. And at the same time, we have global trends, the global trends of malnutrition, including micronutrient deficiencies are on the rise. So the, the, the issues we have with respect to food and nutrition security are getting even much more complex because we, ha we are having issues that, that stem across a whole range of issues from undernutrition to overnutrition and micronutrient deficiencies. Next slide, please. If we look at the situation in South Asia, and I've taken four of the countries here, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan. Of course, with the large population that we have in India, there are many more undernourished people than there are in the other countries. But if you would look at, even, and also look at women, who suffer from anemia. The situation is very dire in, in, in India. And if you look at the number of, of stunted children in the different countries, you would also see a large amount of children who are stunted in India. Of course, as I said, this is also a reflection of the large population in India, but never, but, 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 but never mind, there are still, we, we with, the, with, with the resources that we have in India and the diversity of foods, the diversity of nutritious foods, we should be able to stem the undernourishment and stem the, um, the, the micronutrient deficiencies that are seen in women and children to a much greater extent than we are seeing today. Next slide, please. I want to make mention 
of uh, the situation that we are facing now in many countries, also in India, but many countries. I come from Trinidad. There's also a, a, a grave issues with respect to the impacts of COVID-19 on food and nutrition security. And these figures stem from the beginning of the COVID pandemic. We know that many more people are going hungry. People have lost their jobs. They have lost access to, to, to income and to food. We also know that many more people are being pushed into extreme poverty. And we do know also that the situation is more dire for women than they are for men and for youth than for older workers. And if we look at the effect that we are seeing on children under the, under the age of five years, we know that in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, many more children are being wasted and many more children are dying. Next slide, please. So what, how can we use aquatic foods for nourishing nations, taking into consideration the dire situation we are seeing now with COVID-19, but also the state of malnutrition in India and other countries. And the first thing I would say is that we must recognize the importance and the diversity of aquatic foods, not just fish, but the wide range of aquatic foods, other animals and plants. And we must think about the multiple nutrients that aquatic foods provide, not just protein, but the multiple essential micronutrients and essential fatty acids. And there is one instrument that we can use at a national scale or at a, at a state scale. We can, we can ensure that we have food-based dietary guidelines, which include aquatic foods in these guidelines. If you look globally, we know that 78 countries out of, out of, out of, out of countries that have um, food-based dietary guidelines, 94 countries we have been able to, we, we, we've looked at, have dietary-based uh, guidelines, food-based dietary guidelines. And of these 94, 78 countries include aquatic foods in their recommendations to some extent. It can be much more precise in terms of the quantities that are recommended, the species that are recommended, the regions and the, uh, the regions, the countries and the different population groups. But we do know that if we would have food-based dietary guidelines that, can, that have greater, um, that make greater use of aquatic foods, then we have one instrument for, for, for having aquatic foods in different programs. If you look at some of the recommendations and, and bear in mind that these are the recommendations for adults. So the FAO and WHO, their recommendation is one to two servings of, of aquatic foods per week for adults of a portion size of hundred grams. And the Eat Lancet report, which came out in, 2000, in 2019, gave a recommendation of 28 grams of fish, that could be also aquatic foods per day for adults. And if you look at these two recommendations, they are very much consistent with each other. But it would have also been nice to see specific recommendations for young children, because as I said, as I have spoken about before, aquatic foods are extremely important for young children for cognition and brain development. Next slide, please. Here I'm showing the, the food-based dietary guidelines for India. And um, the, the, the guidelines talk about eating fish more frequently, at least 100 to 200 grams per week for adults. But the message that's given here only takes into consideration the, um, the value of fish in terms of essential fatty acids. There is no mention of fish as a rich source of multiple micronutrients. Next slide, please. 
if we look at the value of fish in India, of course, if you if you look here at this at, at, at this graphic, you would see the percentage of people who eat fish at least at least once a, a, a week, and the darker green colors talk about the, the larger percentages of people who eat fish at least once a week, and it's it's. Um, as we all know, populations along the coast, they eat more fish and aquatic foods than other populations in India. But we must also bear in mind that there are also, for example, tribal populations in other parts of India who, for whom fish and other aquatic foods are culturally acceptable foods and make up parts of, and are an integral part of their diets. So there is, um, when showing this slide, I want, to, I want to make, drive home the point that in India, there are many populations from whom fish is an important part of their diet. They may not be eating sufficient quantities, especially the poor and vulnerable, but there is a basis for using fish and other aquatic animals for nourishing different parts of India and different population groups in India. Next slide, please. Here I'm showing some of the evidence that at a global level that, that pertains to how aquatic foods are important for nourishing nations. And I'm showing some mega data from mega analyses on morbidity and mortality. So we do know that fish intake is associated with reduced mortality risk from heart disease. And the diets that are low in fish and seaweed, they're responsible for about 1% of the world's total burden of disease related dallies. Now, 1% may not sound much, but when you think about this in terms of the whole global population, it's quite a large effect on disability life adjusted years. We also know from, uh, from meta-analyses that the consumption of about 60 grams fish per day is associated with a 12% reduction in mortality. And there are other studies that show that diets which are low in, in omega-3 fatty acids from seafood accounted for 1.4 million deaths in 2010 alone. So there is associations between the intake of aquatic foods and the degree of morbidity and mortality that we see both at global level and at country level. Next slide, please. Why do I use the term that aquatic foods are superfoods? This is because, as I've mentioned so many times before, that aquatic foods provide multiple essential micronutrients and essential fatty acids. And this is a particularly important for growth and development and cognition in the first thousand days of life. So the thousand days of life, we talk about the, um, the nine months of pregnancy, um, the six months of exclusive breastfeeding, where the child depends solely on the mother, for breast milk and for its nutrients. And then from the age of six months to 24 months, where it is recommended that the child continues breastfeeding, but that complementary foods are added to the diets of the child. So one of the ways in which we can um, improve on cognition development of the child is to ensure from at the recommended age of complementary feeding, which is six months of age, that the child gets some small portion of aquatic foods. And a very good way of getting aquatic foods in children is in the form of fish powder, because it's very dense and it, and it does not at the same time give you bulk. You're talking about young children with a, with a small gastrointestinal tract. 
And um, again, from meta-analyses, we know that when pregnant women consume seaweed, we, um, studies have shown that there's an increase in the, in the IQ of their children. And this is based on meta-analysis of about more than 100,000 mother and offspring pairs. And we also know that fish intake in children is associated with low stunting. These are studies we have seen from meta-analysis in many countries. And also we have done quite extensive work in Zambia where we have seen the same, the same results. And we do know that when you have low intake of aquatic foods during pregnancy, this increases the risk of suboptimal neurodevelopment outcomes, including lowered cognition and fine motoric skills in children. So these studies and the results of these studies and the association between the, that you see between intake of aquatic foods and the impact it has on growth, development, and cognition in children gives us the right to term aquatic foods as superfoods for nourishing people. Next slide, please. So one way that you can use aquatic foods um, for, for, for nourishing people is by making nutritious, safe fish-based products. And this gives you the advantage in that you have a high micronutrient density in a small quantity of food. If you use, for example, dried fish products, you have a long shelf life. It's easy to transport. I've seen um, dried fish transported to, up to the mountains in Nepal. And it extends the period of consumption also from in the lean production season. And if you look at the figure, the, the, what I'm showing, the, the, the picture I'm showing, I've, I'm show, I've shown here, this is a wafer that's being produced in, uh, by a small company in Cambodia. And this, it's like a biscuit that's filled with fish powder. And this is used by the government of, uh, of Cambodia and UNICEF for treating malnourished children in Cambodia. And we have, Cambodia has really accepted fish as a superfood and they have decided, they, they have, they, they have decided in the way and in, in the way that they treat malnourished children that fish powder can replace milk powder in the products they use for malnourished children. Next slide, please. We've, we are using also, as I said, it's quite important that we um, look at using aquatic foods as a superfood from the start of the, of the first 1,000 days of life. So we must target the pregnant and lactating woman. And we do so, for example, in Bangladesh, we've developed a fish chutney, but we're using this fish chutney in, in other, in other um countries where we are working as well. In, um, we've introduced it also in Odisha. And one heaped tablespoon of fish chutney is equivalent to 60 grams of raw fish. And they, it's, it's, it's like a mango chutney where you replace the dried mango with fish. And you can see the ingredients that we have that we've added. So it's, it's um, of course, it's culturally acceptable in countries like Bangladesh in, in the state of Odisha and Assam. Well, we've, we've, we've tried, um, we've tried it also in, uh, in Zambia, in, um, in Malawi, but of course we have to make sure that it's culturally acceptable. So the recipes that we use are quite, a, a bit different in Africa than we would use in Asia. Next slide, please. 
I've talked about the, 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 the importance of fish powder and the importance of fish powder as a superfood in complementary foods for young children starting at the age of six months. But even if, yeah, but fish powder is also extremely important. In, if you by adding it to family foods, then you will boost the micronutrient um, concentration in a dish. In, for example, a dish of um, of, uh, of 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 uh, of curry vegetables. Next slide, please. Especially now with COVID-19, but in general for the poor and vulnerable, it's extremely important that uh, governments, both the federal government and the and state government, think about what kinds of programs they, that must be put in place for nourishing the poor and, and vulnerable. And this is important for any kind of national or state development, because if the numbers of your poor and vulnerable populations grow and become larger, it pulls the whole development of your state or your nation down. So, I think, so I believe that countries and states should look very much at, at, at the procurement of aquatic foods and use aquatic foods in, in, in programs such as food-based safety net programs, mother and child feeding programs, school feeding programs for reaching the poor and vulnerable and nourishing those who are undernourished. Next slide, please. This, um, this is one of the a very humbling experience uh, that I've, I've had in Odisha in the KISS school. It is a, a boarding school for thousands. I think at the time I, would, I went there, there were over, I think 25,000 boarding school children, tribal children, who were boarding at this school. And I was asked, and I went there and they were asking me, how can we ensure that the meals that the children get are, are nourishing? Because we do know that if our children are well nourished, their school performance will be better. And when they grow up, they will be smarter. They will be able to earn more money. They will be able to work better. And we, tried to add the, the meal, the midday meal was rice and dalma. And within the dalma, we added um, dried small fish and, and fed the children. And they, they, they enjoyed the meals and, and we, we, they, it, it was very acceptable. And we do hope that we can use some of these um, some of these ideas in other schools, not only in India, but I would say globally, because as I said, we do know that fish and other aquatic foods are extremely important for growth, for development and cognition in children. And it's a superfood that can really mean a lot for national development. Next slide, please. So, I'd like to leave you with five key messages specific for India, but I think it holds true for many nations. One, that we should have national and state level comprehensive policies and investments for aquatic foods to nourish nations. And why do I talk about comprehensive policies and investments? Because very often, our policies and investments are very segmented and se segregated. For example, when we were in Odisha or Sam, we our entry point are the policies uh, and frameworks for the fisheries department. But that's not sufficient. We'd be look, we should be looking at the policies and investments through a whole range of sectors fisheries, agriculture, education, mother and child health care. Um, there are many different sectors that we should all bring together and look at the policies and investments in a comprehensive manner in order to make full use of aquatic foods for nourishing people and nation. 
The next one I want to talk about is that if we would have one instrument as the food-based dietary guidelines, then we can use this instrument for making programs and for getting fish within programs to, to the poor and vulnerable. And this is extremely important now with COVID-19. If we would take the poor and vulnerable, vulnerable, we must also at both national and state level adhere to the right to food and make sure that no one is left behind. And one way we can do this is by putting into action food-based dietary guidelines that contain, that take into consideration aquatic food. There is a, a, a paucity of quality data of aquatic foods, and maybe not just aquatic foods, but, but in general, on, 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 on foods in, in general. We do not know very much about the nutrient comp composition of the diverse range of aquatic foods. We know also very little about food safety of aquatic foods. I mentioned about the, the loss of foods at a global level is one third. If we do not measure how much is lost and wasted, then it's very difficult to put actions in place to reduce the loss and waste. We should know, we should get much better information and data on consumption patterns and the demands of consumers, because demands of consumers can drive the supply chains and drive the supply and the production systems for the very many diverse aquatic foods that we should be taking into consideration. And this data must of course be sex and age disaggregated. And my last point I want to make is about conducting research. So it's not only conducting research on, on the aquatic foods as a single food item. So we should look at the aquatic foods and other foods on the plate of food, and not only look at the intrinsic value of the nutrients or the values that specific aquatic foods bring, but also look at the interaction between the rice, the chapati, the dal, the vegetables, and the aquatic foods on the plate, and especially do research on the enhancing factor of nutrient absorption of, that aquatic foods have on increasing absorption of nutrients from the plant source foods on the, on the plate. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to address you on the Foundation Day Lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your very thought-provoking lecture, Dr. Sakuntala. It is very, very impressive to note the important role of the aqua food system in among the poor and malnourished population in the developing countries. I think uh, Dr. Mahapatra, our president, is already here. Sir, uh, can we see you? Yes, sir, you join. Ah, yes, where is he? Uh, can you bring Dr. Sav here in the front? front? <laughs> Net comes automatic. Automatic? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now it is, uh, friends, it is time to uh, felicitate our chief guest, Dr. Sakuntala. So on behalf of the president and entire fellowship, uh, we are virtually felicitating our chief guest. It's a virtual felicitation of the <laughs> chief guest. Uh, we shall felicitate uh, Dr. Sakuntala. When you are visiting India, we invite you to please come as early as possible to India. And we will felicitate you here or we shall send the plaque and the academic scarf to you by post. So can we felicitate her? Can you bring that slide? Let's give her a big hand.
Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And may I say, Please keep it because I'm looking so much forward to coming back, to coming to India again. So, and I hope that I will be able to meet you all and to see you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, may I request our Honorable President of the Academy, Dr. T. Mahatra, Mahapatra, sir, uh, DG ICR and Secretary uh, Dale to give his uh, chairman's remark. Sir, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, sir, Dr. Joshi. Am I audible? Yes, very yes, much. Sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, before I say anything, let me extend a very hearty congratulations once again to Dr. Sakuntala. And uh, uh, she has been the outstanding performer throughout and in fact, uh, in a very dedicated fashion, she has been focusing and concentrating on, uh, you know, uh, providing uh, nutrition to the class of people who are highly neglected in the society. And that is the best part of the world. Uh, the people in cities and in higher income group not only they have access to food, but also access to quite diversified food system. That could be issues with uh, the negative impacts of more consumption rather than having lack of nutrition as an issue. But in India, in South Asia, in Africa, also many other regions, we do find a section of people who do not have access to food, the food which is enriched for various nutrients, and also do not have access to a very diversified food system. And that is uh, the area where Dr. Sakuntala had worked said how the deprived section of the society can be helped, their nutrition outcomes can be improved significantly, in addition to ensuring livelihood security. In those regions where they are most required, and that is the best part, Dr. Sakuntala, you have devoted your time, not only passionately pursuing one area, but very importantly, facing all odds and working out the diverse facets of evidence-based promotion of nutritional supplementation and diets for the people. And that is the best part. And building those evidences must have, uh, you know, uh, required quite a bit of your energy and effort uh, to do research. And today also you did the mention about it and uh, various things you have mentioned. But uh, building further evidences with regard to nutrition profiles, particularly the aquatic system that we have, I think that is uh, very, very important in the context of India as well. And you have rightly pointed out. And uh, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, built uh, together some small program, but I think we have to, as you have rightly pointed out, that as a national and state policy, how do we mainstream uh, the aquatic system uh, as a part of our food and support the uh, whole system uh, for enriching the private class of people in the country? I think that's a very good message. And uh, providing food as a matter of right, as you rightly say. 
is important. And that's the reason why the government of India, particularly during COVID-19, has uh, supplied the uh, food free to a very large section of our society. And that's a big commitment and the government has really done it. So one is providing food, but providing diverse nutrition, nutritious food to meet uh, the and address malnutrition, which is so widespread. And uh, that is something which is very, very essential. When we heard, in fact, we met and you visited uh, you know, this office, we had discussion on building this program on nutrition. And that is how our program was prepared and then you know approved. And we started working together. And we knew each other, and you have been associated with the Indian programs for quite some time. So, but then we heard the news that uh, you have been actually recognized and your work has been acknowledged at the global level with World Food Prize. We were really excited. And uh, in fact, uh, immediately after hearing the news on the same day, in fact, we decided that you would be the person to deliver our foundation the lecture. In fact, uh, in two days, we collected your address and then, you know, they were all available with my colleagues in the council and started communicating. And uh, many thanks to you for accepting our invitation to deliver this uh, uh, foundation the lecture. It's not because uh, you know you are recognized with the World Food Prize and that's why we have uh, invited. But it's more than that. More on one count, of course, you know we always take pride that you have the Indian roots. Uh, could be generations apart, but there is a, there is a connection. But again, more than that, the kind of issue that you have been addressing throughout your life. They are so pertinent for this country. And the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences also have been discussing many times in the past and continues discussing on improving nutrition outcomes in the country. And uh, many of our senior colleagues who are present, Professor R.B. Singh, for instance, you know, keeps talking about you know, on improving nutrition, whether it is expecting mothers or, uh, you know, children, uh, uh, you know, in different age groups, it's not necessarily uh, below the age of five, where we have serious problems and there are such serious implications. Even school going children at various, uh, in various uh, uh, stages of development, as, uh, you know, nutrition, malnutrition, all the way. It's not that we do not have sufficient food, but we do not really consume, partly because we don't have access and partly because we are ignorant. So nutrition literacy is one aspect which needs a tremendous effort and the creation of awareness about nutrition literacy. I think that is a very important area which uh, the academy, uh, you know, uh, intends to intensify its efforts through its regional chapters, that among school children, uh, among public at large, how we actually, uh, you know, adequately inform and create awareness about uh, the nutrition. Uh, uh, the diversified food system that we have been used to has been uh, uh, now constricted very seriously and uh, we are limited. Our plates are actually having only few items today. So, so that is where we have been actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, limiting our food system and then in the process, uh, you know, malnutrition is all pervading. So, thanks to you, uh, your, uh, uh, you know, kind of presentation, uh, you know, has uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, very uh, in a uh, uh, kind of uh, 
uh, encouraged us in many ways uh, to redouble our efforts, uh, you know, uh, to move in this direction and also build uh, interfaces with the government. Because although it is easier to say that government did not do this or that, government has been doing quite a bit, but how do we really interface further and add on to the programs which are going on or help in modifying those programs so that they become more successful. So I believe at the global scale and also at the national, global level and at the national level, that is what is actually required. How in a constructive manner we be the contributor to the development and provide the right kind of policy, advocacy, and support, and also get involved in the process so that these are all, uh, you know, the requirements are adequately addressed. I think this is where you have worked. You have worked with the governments. You have worked with the institutions. You have worked with the grassroots level with people, with uh, uh, future, uh, uh, you know, men and women. And that is where it is actually, uh, you know, essentially required and how we get more and more involved. And, uh, you know, uh, so I believe our academy will take note of that, what all you have said, and we'll have more interaction as we go, as go, go along. And certainly COVID uh, would relent, and that's the hope. And uh, we believe very strongly that uh, after all, uh, the civilization has been surviving and thriving, and it will also thrive and uh, succeed. Uh, once that happens, certainly uh, may not be uh, too long a time it will take. So we would be back in action critically, and at that time we would expect your presence here, and we would certainly have uh, you know further interactions. Uh, you know how do we actually move further? Uh, as a part of the academy activity, of course, and also as a part of for the program, as we have planned for the Indian Council of Agriculture Research, to delve deeper into building evidences and uh, building databases, so that decision making becomes, uh, you know, easier, uh, and uh, uh, you know, in the process, we become more successful. I take I take this opportunity. Uh, to once again profusely thank you uh, for uh, joining and also accepting and delivering the lecture. So thank you very much. I also take this opportunity to thank all the learned fellowship of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences who have uh, you know spared their valuable time to be with us, you know, uh, and also inspire. Because this is what is actually very, very essential. Despite COVID, uh, initial, there was uh, hesitation to go for digital platforms. And today it has become the norm, new normal. And, uh, uh, you know, all our programs are being conducted uh, using digital platforms. So, uh, and it's easier. You don't have to really move out. And uh, in the <coughs> comforts of your homes, you can be there and enjoy uh, listening to and uh, you know, learn in the process and enrich the knowledge. And uh, that is the kind of positives of COVID. And uh, so, so thank you very much for joining. And uh, I'm sure we all enjoyed the lecture and uh, we will continue our interaction. And I believe uh, uh, the, uh, Dr. Josie uh, would also uh, be sending you information regarding other programs of the, uh, you know, uh, of the academy. Uh, of course, uh, uh, our foundation day of the academy is tomorrow, and uh, of course, uh, you know, we could have uh, had this, had this, had this lecture tomorrow, but uh, unfortunately, Dr. Sakuntala is not, uh, you know, free tomorrow. He is busy, so that's the reason why we have arranged today. And uh, so tomorrow we have probably no program plan, but uh, we have planned other programs in subsequent weeks, and we will be communicated accordingly. 
and we'll keep working despite COVID limitations. And you know, and we have also lost one of our colleagues uh, in the academy uh, due to COVID. And COVID has been very promising. So I would pray uh, uh, for your well-being. Stay at home, stay safe, and continue participating in academy's activity and contribute from your rich experience. And we would certainly greatly benefit from that. Your society would benefit and contribute. Benefit. So profuse thanks to all of you who have joined today. So Dr. Joshi, so with these words, I stop here and thank you very much, Dr. Joshi, for immediately taking action on what we discussed on inviting Dr. Sakuntala. And, uh, and Dr. Sakuntala again agreeing to that. Thank you very much. I stop. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Friends, uh, uh, this is the last item. Uh, it's an honor uh, and privilege for me to express vote of thanks uh, to all those who have uh, contributed to the success of the Foundation Day Lecture. Uh, today, as you know, is the most uh, important day for the Academy and for its fellowship. We have completed fruitful and glorious 31 years. My greetings to entire fellowship on this particular occasion. And on this special day, we have a very special and distinguished personality with us to celebrate our joy and happiness, Dr. Shakuntala, the 2021 World Food Prize Laureate. I joined previous speakers in extending my heartfelt congratulations to her for this prestigious award. We wish for her to receive many more awards and laurels in future. We are extremely grateful to you, Dr. Sakuntala, for readily accepting to our request. Immediately you responded and mentioned that you are traveling on 5th and you can send a um, video recording, but we thought that in person it will be, virtual person it will be better. So we decided to shift to 4th and you readily agreed and we are really grateful for delivering such a superb and lucid lecture. We understand that you are terribly busy, but you gave us time and delivered such a great and brilliant lecture. You have dwelt on the most challenging issue related to malnourishment among children, women, and poor in developing countries, especially Africa and South Africa, and extended it to the role of aqua foods. So it's really very impressive and educative lecture for all of us. All of us enjoyed your thought-provoking lecture. And I assure you that the Academy will take forward your key messages through research and policy advocacy, as our president has mentioned. On behalf of the Academy and on my own behalf, I profusely thank you for your presence with us and giving the Foundation Day Lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed it. And, and my best week and my best greetings to all the fellows of the Academy. Friends, uh, the main person behind the entire program is the president of the academy, uh, Dr. T. Mahapatra. Uh, he proposed to invite Dr. Sakuntala, and despite of his very busy schedule, he guided all of us in planning the Foundation Day lecture and chairing this special program. Thank you so much, sir, for your great support and continuous guidance and giving your chairman's remarks. And we'll follow it up what you referred during your chairman's remarks. Hence, I am grateful to both the vice presidents of the academy, Dr. JC Katyal and Dr. AK Singh for their time to time advice and valuable suggestions in planning and organizing this event. I'm equally grateful to our past presidents, all of his bearers and members of the executive council for their presence. I appreciate their continued support and guidance in successfully con conducting this particular event. I'm delighted to express our sincere gratitude to entire fellowship for joining this important program. I'm very glad that many of our fellows are attending the program from different parts of the world and from different time zones. I'd like to convey to entire fellowship from India and abroad, that your presence is really a great source of inspiration and motivation 
for all of us. My sincere thanks to all of you. I'm also grateful uh, to Dr. J.K. Jena, DDG Fisheries, and Dr. Mohan from World Fish for their facilitating role. Thanks a lot, Dr. Jena and Dr. Mohan. I express my heartfelt thanks to all the distinguished personalities from ICR headquarters, ICR institutes, agriculture universities, CGI centers, and other institutions for attending this function. Last but not the least, I'm extremely grateful to the entire team in the Secretariat of the Academy for extending their wholehearted support in organizing this event. I appreciate their commitment and dedication that despite lockdown and fear of COVID pandemic, they are opening and operating from the academy. The program was not possible, rather impossible, without their support and cooperation. I convey my sincere and very big, big thanks to each and everyone in the Secretariat for making this program a grand success. Friends, uh, we wish to have dinner with all of you after the event, if it was celebrated in person. Unfortunately, it is not possible this year. But I'm sure that we have enriched in our thinking, thought process, and innovative ideas to address food and nutritional security. Friends, once again, my greetings to everyone on the Foundation Day of the Academy, and thanks to each and everyone for joining us in one of our most important celebrations. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. So with, this, we, with this, we close our function. So thanks a lot, Dr. Sakuntala again. Thank you and so much. And all our guests. Thank you.